I remember going to bed, and I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was listening to the wind, and I was listening to every nail in my house groan. Every bit of framing in my house was moving because of this wind, and I knew that was going to change how the next chapter of our lives were going to be. Growing up in Vermont, being pretty uh, rural, we basically had to invent our own fun. I feel like a lot of times we were building forts, tree houses, anything outside that kept us outside. Being outside was, I think, something that my mother forced the hand and just knew that it was a form of like tough love. I just believe that nature is where they're going to really learn a lot about life. I feel like we were kind of let loose in the woods to do whatever we thought was OK. But what transpired throughout the day was building forts, digging foxholes. It was the imagination of Mama Nature and everything that we could find outside. We tied our story to it, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Jameson graduated from college, and he called me and said, you know, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't want to go back to school. I have a degree in psychology. I said to him, well, you know, you're 23, you have no debts, why don't you go do something you always want to do and enjoy life for a little bit? And says, you know, I think I want to learn how to build wooden boats. In my mind, a wooden boat had some type of souls and I needed to find a wooden boat builder. And then I found this one shop and I walked in and there's a guy over there shaping wood on the one side. Then there's another guy on the other side of the shop. I can smell the, the hot like metals and sparks coming off the other dude's area. And I'm just thinking, like, this, this is what I'm supposed to do right here. It was like Jonathan Livingston Seagull, like I found my flock. He called me up and said, I got a job at this boatyard. You got to come see what, what these guys are doing. I think we should build wooden boats. I literally drove from Colorado to South Carolina, and I pulled into this boatyard, saw my brother, had this big embrace, and I looked back, and I was like, oh, man. We got to do this. Four and three quarters. We can just cut uh, from this face. Four and three quarters. That's what I'm talking about. Ryan and I worked for $6 an hour. Well, I got $6 an hour. Somehow I was special. He got demoted to $5 an hour, but we worked for like very little pay for like a good number of years with the idea that we would build a boat together. Here we are. There's a boat yard away from the boat yard. Come with me on this walking tour. I don't think the initial idea was so much was to build our own, but quickly that changed and we started taking a lot more notes and we started paying close attention so that if we ever had the opportunity to build our own, we knew exactly how to do it. And Kakoa began on an old decommissioned Navy base in North Charleston, South Carolina. We built Kikoa uh, to sell her. Even though that's the way I think we had it in our minds, there was definitely something about it that never seemed like we were gonna let go of this boat. It took two years to build Kikoa, and um, there's this feeling of once you build a boat, I can't really ever free yourself of, of the, uh, the connection. There was something about the boat that was way more than just some project. There was a life and a soul that seemed to come with a boat. And it's interesting because when you build a boat, everything's kind of constructed a lot like any project. But as soon as you launch that boat, that's when it kind of comes to life, and it's always in motion. It never stops.
When we finished Kikoa, it was like, it was not looking so good for selling a million dollar luxury item, considering that the whole economy was really not so great in 2008. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. The stock market is now down 21%. 43%. But in the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped out. Customers are freaked out. Every day they're pounding it. This is volatility we haven't seen since, you know, 1929. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Somehow, these guys come along, and they're just going to pay, like, full asking price. They were headed to the Caribbean with this thing, and they wanted to deliver a Kikoa in December, which is the beginning of winter storm season. They sailed out 300 miles offshore, two days into a 10-day voyage, getting, you know, 30 to 40-foot seas. Six o'clock in the morning, I put the phone to my ear, before he said anything, before I said anything, all I could hear was just the sound of the wind. The captain started to speak and he said, Ryan, Ryan, it's bad. We're having a hard time. We're taking on water. I think we're gonna abandon ship. Coast Guard went out 300 miles, dropped a basket down onto Kikoa, evacuated the four delivery crew and flew them back to safety. That, that was a moment where we, we had lost the boat. There's, there's no way. There's no way it's coming back. Six days after the boat went missing, we got on a fishing boat, 36 hours of searching a giant quadrant. And we found the boat. I mean, at the end of the day, she basically shook him off and came back to us. We are on scene with the vessel Kakoa. I'm going to be passing our coordinates at this time. All of a sudden, this thing falls in your lap, and we got it back. I mean, it, man, we know what to do with this thing. Let's charter it. Let's go back to that little island that was so good to us. After you get rid of me. You know, I think we had a thousand bucks in our account between two families and a startup business, and we ran our first charter. And we said, like, okay. A little money to pay for the booze and the food for the next one, send the rest home to the families, and uh, let's run another one. Those guys are just great, man. Ryan and Jemison, you know, good feeling, good vibe with good, you know, good people, man. If you've been on that boat, you'll see, man, that boat is one of a kind. Kukau has given so much to St. John. And it's just, it is, it's a, it's family. So if someone wants to crew on Kikoa, they gotta answer some questions. Did you ever sniff glue? The G Kranz, at what elevation in the Rocky Mountains do the deer turn into elk? Are you offended by swear words? I mean, the answer I'm looking for there is fuck no. Did you go to college? I don't care, I hope you didn't. Do you surf? Somebody was like, well, I used to. I'm like, well, you can be hired, but I'm not your friend anymore. Like, what the hell are you talking about? You, you used to. You gave up? Jameson's always on an adventure. One afternoon, Jameson's like, we're going to just throw tomahawks at a thing and, like, just drink a bunch of beers and see what we can hit. Jameson is a hard-working, determined pain in the ass. <laughs> He's younger than I am uh, on a maturity. <laughs> Level. <laughs> Ryan is the opposite. He's kind of the sweeter, more level headed brother, I think. He really just is like a blanket, just makes sure everything's good. There needs to be both of them. One without the other doesn't work. They're like, what's the. Peter Pan, the Lost Boys, or whatever they are. Yeah, they're those little kids. <laughs> we had this utopic idea, like, you captain one day, I'll captain the next. We'll be our own crew. We can make lots of money. We'll live in the islands. Dude, reality, man, reality.
My family and I primarily live in Lyons, Colorado. Now I take care of everything from bookings, marketing, basically all the non-romantic side of a business. Turning this into a bowyard, I think, was an evolution of, first of all, I just came up and fell in love with a spot. And then because I build boats, I thought, like, well, how could I just hang out here? If I built a boat in the backyard, uh, I get to hang out here quite a bit and um, just make, make wood chips and make sawdust. It's very basic stuff, the cutting and fitting of wood. You know the boats that we've built? They're kind of like our forts that we used to build when we were little. They're just highly organized forts. Uh, this is fiberglass dust, uh, so it's particles that make you itch uh, quite a bit. But I'm pretty much immune to it at this point. Uh, it's already at the two-year mark, and we've got a ways to go. Kikoa took us two years to put together. It's one hell of a big sculpture now. Land sculpture, that's what everyone calls it. <laughs> hopefully not. Someday, I hopefully, I'll launch it. This is such a nice place to finish. It'd be a shame to uh, prematurely take it out of here. Plus, it's hurricane season. That's probably going to tear this place up. Every year, as soon as hurricane season's even close, I start to watch weather daily, if not three times a day. You not only watch the systems, but you watch all the other conditions that can make or break whether a storm becomes something. What's up, bro? Hey, man. <laughs> What's up, dude? What's up, man? You all right? Yeah. You could feel it. You could feel it in the air. Irma was just sizing up to be a beast. There is, there's energy. It kind of gets you hyped up. You know, I've had that with past storms, but nothing like this. Latitude 50.6 West. Extremely dangerous hurricane Irma heading for the northern Leeward Islands. Brand new tropical storm developed. A category two hurricane. Oh, a major hurricane with a well-developed Expected dive. to strengthen over the next coming days. With Irma, it was pretty much game on. Uh, the winds are getting down to the surface here, probably close to 175. The 175 will be devastating. Just went to the storage unit, started getting every piece of chain. A category four, category five storm. Looks like it's gonna maintain this category five strength. Immediately started putting down ground tackle, pulling off sails, life rafts, everything that was on the exterior of that boat that could move, we took off. This monster storm is now posing a major threat. We don't just put anchors down, we put anchors down and we preload them. Continuing to churn for over 24 hours. On 15 different points of contact to the ocean floor and each one of them was like a guitar string. It is just ready. Hurricane Irma is now the most powerful storm ever recorded in the open Atlantic Ocean. That has one forecaster warning that the Leeward Islands are going to get destroyed.
Irma is now the strongest hurricane to ever plow into the Leeward Islands. We walked out of that building and realized that our lives had changed. This does not look good. <laughs> The mind can't even comprehend what's going on. Holy crap. A bomb just went off. Omar was a powerful stuff, man. Omar too many tops them all. Every tree, every bush, devastation. Omar make boat fly like a kite. Hundreds of boats just piled up, pushed ashore, just gone forever. Those who lived on board don't have a home. Your insurances don't pay out, you know, nothing covers you, and your life has changed. That's devastating. Fuck. 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 Fuck, brother. Came around the corner, and before we even saw, we go, okay, don't see the mast. And saw her up on the bank and we could clearly see that the mass had come down. We could see that the railings were trashed. It looked we did, like a total loss. Jesus, dude, someone else's fucking bow. The Yetis are in the engine room. The port side stern has got a rip, looks like a tin can opened up, and you've got a 12-foot hole in the hull, just imploded. Everything was damaged. All the seating had been destroyed. The mast was gone, all the rigging was down. Ladder, the bow beam, everything had either been scratched on a, from a cosmetics standpoint or had been completely damaged and destroyed. That's it. Her back is broken, she's done. I asked him, I said, well, what was it like? And I mean, it's like this freight train outside your door, taking your roof and everything else. It's like, well, when's it coming in? And Jamie and Ryan told me how for four or five hours, it was pretty quiet. They didn't talk much. I think they were scared. I think they were scared to death. Two months without electricity, as of right now, I think uh, if we got electricity by Christmas, so that's another, another month. Well, no, month and a half. Another month and a half. So three and a half months without power. We looked at it. It looked like the hull had broken in half, the mast was broken off, railings were ripped off, rudders, engine shafts, engine swamped. It looks like a total loss, but as you dig your way out, you just don't give up. If you envision a tree from the very beginning, a seedling, a little sapling, it's, it's blowing around in the wind. And it's having to handle that wind and that flexing. Because it's alive, it has a life, 
it's growing to resist those things without showing fatigue. And that's a really important point about wood boats is they have, they have the beauty, the resilience. Because it had life, it has that ability to flex. A pessimist will find a difficulty in every opportunity. To him, everything is impossible. But the optimist will say, He'll find an opportunity in every difficulty. He'll find an opportunity in it. When I look at Jameson and Ryan, that's what I see in them. That's how they move. Nothing is impossible. I feel like the decision was made within the first week. Uh, I mean, if we felt like we couldn't fix that boat or if we had decided not to, we wouldn't have dug her out. Had it been anyone else's boat, that boat would have been scrapped, compacted, and put in a dump. But because it's Jameson and Ryan, and let's be honest, that boat's their baby. They built it, they've relaunched it before when it, when it got damaged and it was lost to sea the first time. It's been their baby through thick and thin. They, they don't always agree. They don't have a perfect relationship, who does? But I think when push comes to shove, there's nothing that could get between them. They, they just have a very strong bond and they've always had it. They can embrace each other in a way that is so forgiving and accepting. That's really unique. Like, that's not typical. I guess they kind of follow from each other, man. Just copy from each other and just all work together as one head. You know, one head together, move mountains, man. You put two heads together, you could move. There's no limits to what you can do, and that's, that's them. I don't know, we have a way of just dealing with it, laughing through it, joking about it when we can, and in some ways, I think we're bred for this shit. That's, that might That's be. not mold. Okay. It might be mold. Mm, the is good. <laughs> I have another low point today. <laughs> I had a lot of low points. <laughs> Your sandwich. Maybe I was just really hungry. weeks without ever being further than this right here. And uh, that has paved the way our entire lives of all the, the things we've been through. It's made the difference. You know, you share the burden with somebody, I don't know, I don't know what it is. And then obviously the brotherhood just, there's a bond that says no matter how pissed you get or, or how scary something is, is like you've got your brother with you. And there's something about that where you can walk into war if you've got your brother beside you. We completely put the boat back together 
in a way that is stronger than the original. There were low points, and then there was always, no, you know, there's no way. We will dust off the ripped up pieces of that boat, and we will put it back together. All right, the hardest hit part of the boat was this whole hull. This entire area all the way from basically about here. This all had to be totally restructured. Bottom of the keels were ripped off. This whole area was compromised. The ends of all these beams were stress cracked. Both sides, rudders, struts, drive shafts, damage on both inboard hulls. The fuel tanks had to be pulled out. So this is all new material here. Today we have to figure out how the final push of the boat is going to go here. Big boat's going to get ready to tow us out, so it's the final preps. Getting a little nervous, honestly. I don't want to damage anything on the way out. claim to know what St. John ultimately needs, but I know that we're a, a part of the community here. And I know there's a lot of people rooting for us, and, and someone said it to me the other day, they said, you know what, I'm not gonna feel like this island's gone anywhere until I see that boat on its mooring again. You're surrounded by people like that, you feel like you've done something right in your life. We're on the right path. If you let go of that, you'll be, the only thing you'll be tied to is us. You want to pull it yeah. back and coast into it. And that's when I, that's when I puke, Elliot, right there, and waiting for that snap. No, that's my job. <laughs> We're starting to move into position here, so it's clear in the area. All right, Silver Cloud, give us 30 seconds and we're ready to go. All right, that looks pretty good. Okay, roger that. Okay, clear, guys. <laughs> Ryan, hold on. This is gonna be a wild ride. I see somehow an extension of myself and my brother, and I see a lot more than a boat. Hey, brother. Hey, man. Jameson? Yeah, yeah. She's a member of the family. Toa has a spirit. She's found ways to survive and push through, and I believe we're just along for the ride. They don't give up. They keep trying things, and... And if, if, and if it don't work, they try again. They try something else. Giving up is easy. That's the easy road. This boat has taught us again and again to just stay with it. We need to grind out, and I guess this other one here. I tell you what, man. There's no one else I'd rather go through a disaster with than do it because I've never had so much fun. This boat has had a serious ass whooping. <laughs> Several times. I mean, this boat. <laughs> it always gets the ass whooping and we have to rebuild it. It's like our lot in life to rebuild this boat. <laughs> Good thing we like adventure. That's all I can say, because it just keeps coming. What, what is adventure? Adventure is the tragedy that never occurs. I don't even know who said it, but it wasn't me. <laughs>